me know if you can't hear me, okay? All right, I'm going to go back. Now, and so uh, before I got to the point where I was kneeling on the cold, hard cement patio, is that right? You had gotten up in the middle of the night, you had slipped out of the bed, and you had left out, and then all of a sudden, everything started to just cut off. Okay, okay, I got it, okay. So what I did was, I left the parsonage through one of the exit doors, and with my flashlight in my hand, I began to follow the side of the building toward the front of the church. And I came to the front entrance of the church. Now there, right in front of the front doors of the church, there was a cement patio outdoors, nearly the same width as the building. And that we use that patio to welcome worshipers every Sunday morning as they walk to the top of the hill where the church stood. But at night, exposed to every direction below, that place seemed so vulnerable to whatever lurked down below in the dark. But at that moment, I knew this was the place where I had to kneel down and seek God. So I fell to my knees on this cold, hard cement patio in the fearful darkness. I bent over with my face to the ground before my God. I asked him to keep me from the evil presence, which seemed to envelop me and surround me in the darkness. I reminded God that I had nothing left to teach his children. And I begged him to give me deeper understanding of his word. Every few moments, I raised my head to look around, <laughs> afraid of what I might see standing over me in the darkness. A swarm of mosquitoes attacked me as I prayed, hungry and unrelenting. I knelt there outside in the dark for over an hour, crying out to the Lord. In my kneeling position, with my face to the ground, my eyes closed and not raising a hand against the mosquitoes. I felt so exposed and defenseless and helpless. But in this, I came to see the wisdom of God. In such an exposed and defenseless position, I was forced to learn to trust in Him. And so morning after morning after morning, at five o'clock, at four o'clock, sometimes 3.30, the Holy Spirit would wake me up. Now, by nature, I'm a late riser, but day by day by day, the Lord continued to wake me up hours before dawn. I would go outside. I would go to the front, kneel down at that cold hard cement patio in the darkness and cry out with all my heart, beseeching the Lord to teach me his word. And after over an hour outside in the darkness, I would go inside to the church. At six o'clock every morning, we would join with a small group of prayer warriors for another hour of prayer in the sanctuary. By that time, the sun was up. And during the day, after that, I would spend hours studying the Bible. Now, that was my Bible school. Through the many hours spent in prayer and immersed in the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Spirit revealed to me deep and beautiful things which I had never seen before. And so whatever the Lord gave me, I passed on to his flock. And this way I grew in the knowledge of the scriptures as never before. And then the Lord began to give us opportunities to minister to the sick. Now, one day we were told of a woman who had not come to church for a long time. She was sick and she had no one to take her to church. So we went to visit her. Now, on that day, it had been raining steadily. To get to her house, we had to wade through dirty water several inches deep. A brother from the church led us into her dilapidated house. She was seated when we came in, and she could not get up to greet us. And then the story we heard from her lips was really a pitiable one. Looking at her, we could believe everything she related. Her skin had been browned by the years of working under an equatorial sun. It was peeling, exposing underneath pink patches of diseased skin all over her body. Malnutrition had done its work on her mind. Her conversation sometimes was slow and unsure. 
She had very little strength in her legs and for a long time had not been able to get up and walk by herself. And so we sat down to get acquainted with her. It became clear that her physical problems were but a mirror reflecting much misery and bitterness in her heart. Her life had been filled with unbearable hardship for which she blamed her husband and which she vented on her children with foul language right in front of us. Her house, now long neglected, could not even keep her family dry. The rain fell unimpeded into the house through large sections missing from the roof above. The wooden floor below was rotten from the continual drenching by the rain. Everything was in disarray and neglect. Her house, her family, her body, and her soul. How much misery can a person endure? And so we comforted her with the word of the Lord. I would speak in English and Lucio would translate into a local Chinese dialect. Now I can speak the local language, but at that time I could not. I was hoping to bring light into her soul. And then streaks of hope began to dawn in her heart. But what about her body? Would the Lord not touch her body in the way he touched so many as I had read in the Gospels in the book of Acts? I remembered what Peter did with the lame beggar in Acts chapter 3. So could it be possible that God would do the same thing? I decided to try it for myself. And so I said to her, I said, would you like us to ask God to heal your skin condition and to heal your legs so that you'll, you can get up and walk? And she agreed. And then I began to pray, Father, we ask you to heal your daughter from this cursed skin condition and to give her strength so that she'll be able to get up and walk. Through Jesus, you have forgiven her of her sins. Now, Father, heal her of these infirmities. Therefore, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command your legs to be made strong right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. With that, I took her by the hand, just as I imagined Peter had done to the lame beggar, and helped her to her feet. I led her down steps to the front yard outside, and then I let go of her hand. She started walking. At first, quite gingerly, as if confused that she was doing something that she wasn't supposed to be doing. Moreover, she had not used her sense of balance to walk for such a long time that she was afraid of falling. So she extended her arms out to her sides to balance herself, and she kept walking. After circling a few times in the yard, she climbed back up to the front porch and sat down again. We looked at her in suspense, awaiting her verdict. My legs feel stronger, she finally said. In our hearts, we were shouting, praise the Lord. And she came to church the following Sunday. Now, on another occasion, we were taken to visit an elderly Christian couple who lived upstream on the banks of a tributary called the Skyon River. Uh, they and their sons and their families had carved a small family enclave out of the riverbank jungle. When we arrived, they welcomed us warmly. And so we all sat down to get acquainted. And then I addressed the elderly man. I called him grandfather, according to the local customs. And I said to him, how old are you, grandfather? I'm 88 years old, he replied. And I said, well, the Lord has certainly blessed you with good health and long life. And grandfather said, yes, he has. But I have a problem with my hearing. I cannot hear anything at all with my left ear. It's sometimes difficult for me to understand what my sons are saying to me. And something began to move in our hearts. We knew that Jesus had made the deaf to hear when he was on earth. Would he help this elderly man now? And so I said to grandfather, I said, grandfather, Jesus healed the sick 2000 years ago. We believe that he does the same thing today. Would you like us to ask the Lord to open up your deaf ear? Grandfather agreed. And so in the name of Jesus, we asked the Lord to restore grandfather's hearing in his left ear. After prayer, I stuck my finger into the left ear and with as much authority as I could muster, I commanded that the ear be opened in the name of Jesus. And then I asked, grandfather, can you hear what I'm saying? I had covered up his good ear with my hand. Uh, what did you say? I can't hear what you're saying, he answered. 
his hearing had not at all improved. And I said, Grandfather, the Lord will heal you in his own timing. There was nothing else we could say. But late that night, long after we had gone home, a strange thing happened to Grandfather. As he lay in bed, his left ear felt a cool sensation, as if someone was blowing softly into it. It continued all night. At dawn, Grandfather happily discovered that he could hear with his left ear. He could even make out the words one of his daughters-in-law were whispering about him in the next room. Hallelujah. See, this is what we experienced at the very beginning of our ministry. Yeah, 42 years ago. And so, because of the miracles, people believed on Jesus and we baptized them. Here the baptism is taking place in a, an area which had been flooded due to rains. So this was our very first congregation back in 1978. About a hundred souls. You can see Lucille and I seated on the ground in the front row, the first row, to your left, near the left side. You can see us there, I believe. And this was our church, the Christian National Evangelism Church in West Borneo, which we pastored for five months. At that time, I was not even 30 years old. Now, after our five months in Sangao, when we learned the Word of God and we saw miracles, we were baptizing people, we asked the Lord for a greater challenge. And what would that greater challenge be? Could God use me, even though I'm a new believer, to plant a church in a completely unreached area? Could God do that? I wanted a greater challenge. Now, we happened to know another servant of God in Sangao, and he told us that there was a village about three hours upstream from us, he had been there and shared the gospel with children, but he had done nothing more than that. And so I thought, hey, let's go up there. And so we took a boat. I think this was like a one and a half horsepower boat. We go up the river for about three hours and we come upon the village of about 300 homes. The name of the village was Biang. around for a home to rent and we rented this house isn't it beautiful and you know how much we paid uh, notice the windows there there's no screen uh, and there's no glass that's all okay the rent for three months was eight dollars eight dollars a terrific deal things are really cheap there however there was a reason why it was so cheap. In the house, there was no furniture, no chairs, no bed, no kitchen, no sink, no running water, no stove, no electricity, of course, therefore no lights, no glass or screens on the windows, so anything could fly in, not just mosquitoes, but chickens could fly in through the window. And that happened to us on a few occasions. And no bathroom, no bathroom. And so where do you go? Right there. It's an outhouse floating on the river. Now, I'll leave it up to your imagination. Uh, exactly how do you go in such a place? But let me tell you, the water is continuously flushing. That'll give you a hint. How do you go? You don't have to flush the toilet after you go. The river takes care of it. You see, there's a hole uh, at the bottom, at the floor. When you walk into that outhouse, there's a hole there. And you, uh, you do your thing through the hole, okay? And uh, there's no toilet paper. Uh, what about taking a bath? Well, <laughs> there's no bathroom in the house, so you take a bath right there. 
Okay, I'll leave the rest up to your imagination. But we had a lovely view from our front door. Okay, there's Lucille. And there's the river, the Kapwas River, right at our front door. And so, <clears throat> under such living conditions, Lucille and I set up our home. From the outside, uh, it appeared bleak, meaning our situation. We had found ourselves in a remote riverbank village in the middle of West Borneo, which in turn was known as the least developed areas of Indonesia. There was absolutely nothing to do for fun in the village. No movie theaters, no restaurants, no parks, no department stores, shopping malls, no TV, just the Voice of America on our battery-powered radio. No magazines, newspapers. The only available activity would seem to be watching the Kapuas River flow by. And so, in the eyes of the world, Lucille and I were destitute. We had given up all our earthly possessions in the States when we left. No more car, no more house. Well, we never had a house. <laughs> no savings in the bank, no stocks, no investment portfolio. Our monthly income amounted to $200 a month, which the Lord graciously provided through my older sister, Irene, in New York City. In the eyes of the world, we were without hope. Strangely enough, though, I had never felt such a sense of meaningfulness as I had living along the banks of the Kapuas. We were living for the Lord and doing His work. The challenge and commission which He has set before us to bring the kingdom of God to the people of Biang spawned in me such a joy and excitement that nothing else in the world mattered. Now we're going to take you on a little tour of the village of Biang. Here's an idol temple. You see, in the village of Biang, of course, there are no followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, they worship spirits. They're animists. There's even a kitchen spirit which they worship. They worship ancestors, and they believe and trust in witch doctors. Okay. And so we began to hold meetings in our home. And we would go from house to house telling people about Jesus. This elderly lady, she came to a meeting in our home. And uh, she had a problem. She had been cursed by a witch doctor. And so she felt constant pain in her left eye, like being poked by a needle 24 hours a day. And then she said, can your Jesus heal me of the constant pain? You see, we had already shared the gospel, how Jesus was the Son of God. He died on the cross to bear our sins. He rose on the third day, and if we put our faith in him, we have eternal life. You know, fine. But she said, but can your Jesus help me now? I've got this 24-7 pain. Can he heal me of this pain? And for me, that was an opportunity. I said, okay, I'm going to lay hands on you, and if you are healed, you believe in Jesus. And so I laid my hands on that eye, and I rebuked the spirit of pain in that eye in the name of Jesus, and I commanded the pain to stop in Jesus' name. And afterwards, I said, Lucille, ask her, how does she feel? At first, Lucille really didn't want to ask, because Lucille, her background is Baptist, it's very traditional, and you don't ask people if they are healed, because what if they're not healed? After you minister to them, you say, God bless you. See you next Sunday. <laughs> but I said, Lucille, ask her. And so Lucille, she translated it into Chinese. She said, how do you feel? And the lady said, when you laid hands on me, I felt this really cool sensation in my eye. And it slowly descended into my heart. And then when it went into my heart, I felt so good. And the pain is completely gone. Uh, this lady and her whole family accepted Christ. Her whole family meeting her son and her daughter-in-law. And those are her grandchildren. Uh, everyone accepted Christ except for her husband, seated right next to her. Uh, he's a coffin maker. 
Now, one day, a woman came to us, okay? She was desperate. She was a woman from the village. We had seen her before, but we were not acquainted with her. And she came to our home. And she said, please come over to see my son. He's in great pain. And Lucille said to her respectfully, oh, please come in, auntie. What happened to your son? See, over there, when you talk to older people, you call them auntie, uncle, grandfather, grandmother, and so forth. And she told us the following. She said, yesterday afternoon, when he was walking home from school, he suddenly collapsed on the ground. He didn't trip over anything. He just collapsed. His leg was in a lot of pain. He tried to get up, but he couldn't. So he crawled all the way home. I called for a witch doctor to have a look at him. She came to see him. She broke open a chicken egg to see what had afflicted him. According to the position of the egg yolk, she said that my son had been attacked by a strong demon. She said she couldn't do anything for him, and she left. And so we followed the woman all the way back to her house. She led us into a room where her son lay on the floor, clad only in a pair of trousers. His hair was disheveled, and dark semicircles hung under his eyes. And he said to us weakly, I couldn't sleep at all last night, looking up at us. My leg hurt so bad. I was writhing on the floor all night. I can't get up. I can't take it much longer. Pain and exhaustion were etched on his face. I looked at him and I said, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be healed. Do you want to believe in him? Now, today, the year 2020, that's not how I preach the gospel. <laughs> First, I heal them in Jesus' name, and then I tell them about who Jesus is and what Jesus can do for them if they believe. Okay, But this was, yeah, over 40 years ago, and this is what I did back then. Do you want to believe in Jesus? And this young man said, uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll believe in him, he answered through lips contorted by pain. It was difficult to see how else he could have answered under the circumstances. And then I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And with that, I took him by the arm and I dragged him to his feet. Walk, I said. I pulled him forward and I released him. With a big step, he lurched forward and kept on walking he reached the opposite wall he stopped and turned around still on his feet i asked how does it feel and he said it it doesn't hurt anymore is the pain gone and he said yes it's gone and i asked can you walk now yes and color and life were returning to his face and i said jesus has healed you believe in him and follow him for the rest of your life the young man, his mother and father, his older brother and sister, all came to believe on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And there, in the back row, on the left, is his mother. After the many miracles taking place in this village, the people believed in Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior, and they were baptized. Now, uh, we did not baptize them in the Kapuas River where you had those floating outhouses by the riverbank. No, <laughs> we baptized the people in a tributary which fed into the Kapuas River. Praise the Lord. So glorious seeing people born again into the kingdom of God. And so we decided to take the gospel to a neighboring village. There was another village nearby, but there were no roads. And so we went out and rented a boat. It had a, a small outboard engine. I believe it was a 25 horsepower outboard. And uh, every night we would take this boat, every evening we would take this boat, leave Biang, and go upstream to another village where we would share the gospel. 
upstream about a half hour, there was a smaller village called Menjaya. And there we were received at this home where we would share the gospel almost every evening. And the owner of this home, he was the man of peace in this village, according to Luke chapter 10. He's standing in the middle, Brother Su Fong. And so there, almost every evening, we would share the gospel. We would minister to the sick. People would be healed and accept Christ. And here you see we're having Holy Communion inside that little house. You can see the bread on the table. You see that long object there? That's the bread. And you can see Lucille way, way, way in the back near the center. That's Lucille with a smile. Now, one night after our evening meeting in Minjaya, we set out to return to Biang. Oh, hold it. Before we go there, let me just say this. Now, God, in his unfathomable grace, visited the little village of Biang with manifestations of his kingdom. Through these, a little flock began to form, calling themselves believers in Jesus Christ. For the very first time in this remote area, since Satan took dominion over the earth, Men and women saw and received the light from their Creator. And people were baptized. Now, let me share with you what happened one night after our evening meeting in Minjaya. Okay. We set out to return home to Biang. And after Lucille climbed into the boat, I started up the outboard engine by pulling on the rope. And then after the engine started, I pushed off from the pier with my leg and we set off downstream to return to Biang. The night was pitch black from the heavy clouds which had rolled in earlier that evening. Moments after we left Menjaya, the wind picked up ominously. Then the rain came. Visibility plummeted to zero. Now under nighttime skies, I had no problem steering the boat since I could make out the land on each side of us as we headed down river toward Biang, when it was not raining. Even under dark nighttime skies, we could make it being guided by the lamps of Biang down river, which we could see in the distance as we approached. This is when the sky was clear. But with the rain coming down that night, I could see absolutely nothing. And I couldn't tell whether we were going downstream or heading toward land. The river at that point was perhaps nearly a half mile wide. So I slowed down the outboard to just over idle speed and I allowed the boat to drift. So squinting my eyes to keep out the pelting rain, I looked ahead, straining to catch a glimpse of any speck of light in the distance, which hopefully would lead us to Biao. And th thoughts began to occur to me. What are we doing here in this little rowboat in the middle of a storm on a river in remote West Borneo? How did we ever get ourselves into such danger? Even as my grip on the steering arm of the outboard tightened and my eyes scanned the darkness for light, my thoughts turned inward. I thought to myself, hey, I am not supposed to be here. I've never driven a boat before in my entire life and I'm not a good swimmer. We're in danger. What are we doing here? I'm supposed to be in civilized America pursuing a successful career as a respected scientist or businessman. I'm supposed to be rising in the world, owning a big house and driving an expensive sports car. But then suddenly it became clear to me, even as I shivered under the wind and the driving rain. Yes. Yes, that's right. God has taken me away from all that. Yes, by his grace, I have become a citizen of another world, a heavenly kingdom where I am no longer entangled in the desires of this life. Yes, God has chosen me to receive the highest calling of all, to give up everything and to become his servant. That's why we are here in this little boat in the middle of nowhere. How strange 
and unfathomable are the ways of God. Praise his wonderful name. Finally, I understood. Suddenly, Lucille screamed. Bill, Bill, there's a light over there. Lucille shouted over the din of the rain, the winds, the waves, and the outboard. I looked, and in the distance on our left, a light flickered faintly. Praise God. Hopefully, we had not drifted too far past the village of Biang. I steered the boat toward the light, compensating for the current which pulled us steadily downstream. As we drew closer, more lights appeared. It was Biang. We looked for lights that were familiar markers to us. The rain had begun to subside. And as we pulled up alongside an outhouse near our house, where we could tie up the boat and remove the outboard, the rain stopped. But I was wet, fatigued, and cold. I wanted to go up to our house right away and change into some warm, dry clothing. But we couldn't leave the outboard engine outside at night. Unattended, such things were known to disappear. And so I gave the flashlight to Lucille. I had her hold it. And then I loosened the vices which held the outboard to the boat and hoisted it up out of the water onto the boat. And now for the really tricky part. Now standing on that shaky little rowboat on the water, I hoisted the 60 or 70 pound engine up onto my shoulder. And as I prepared to step off the boat over to the pier, straining to keep my balance, I wondered, as I usually did, how would it be if while stepping over to the pier, I stepped and fell into the river with an outboard engine on my back? And so very gingerly and carefully, I stepped off the boat onto the pier. I made it and I headed toward the riverbank, which led up to the village and to home. The rain had soaked the riverbank, turning it into very slippery mud. If only my friends at home in the States could see me now, I thought, as I lowered the outboard onto the pier and I took off my socks and my shoes, handing them to Lucille. The outboard then went back up onto my shoulder. I trudged forward into the mud, digging my toes down hard with each stride to get better traction in the mud. Up the riverbank, I plodded, taking each step with painful care until my legs began to ache. Thank the Lord our house was so close to the riverbank. I reached the house. The outboard now felt like 200 pounds. Climbing carefully up the four ladder rungs of the so-called stairs leading up to our front door, I went inside. I set the engine down on its stand in a corner of the room. I thought to myself, we're home at last, breathing a sigh of relief. I can't believe we're out here in the jungles of Borneo risking life and limb. I can't believe we're out here doing all these things. But God had brought us safely home again. In this way, two little villages were planted in the two villages within three months in 1979. Compelling miracles convince the people that our God is the only true God. This was the church in Biang. And you see that little girl in the black circle there? When she grew up, she became the pastor of this church. And this church is still there. And she was the pastor. You can see Lucille in the back row all the way to your left. I'm not there because I'm the one who took the picture. This was the church in Menjaya. You can see, see Lucille front row all the way to the left. And these were the believing children in the village of Biao. And so after 11 amazing months in Indonesia, I was so thankful. I was more or less a new believer I had no training, no mission agency, no experience, but I had been filled with the Holy Spirit 
and God used me in an amazing way. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Who am I? It was by the grace of God alone. And so after the 11 months, we returned home to the U.S. Now, why? It was because after a year, our round-trip tickets between Los Angeles and Jakarta were going to expire. And so we had to go home, and I thought it would be a good time to go home to share with the people what we have seen here in Indonesia. And so the following year, in 1980, after nine months in the U.S. sharing our testimony, we returned to West Borneo to take on even far greater challenges for the Lord. And I'll be sharing that at our next gathering, part two of our adventures in Borneo. I want to share that one with you in particular. So, please join us a week from today. If you'd like to have a free copy of Dancing on the Edge of the Earth, send me an email at Elijah003 at Gmail, Elijah003 at Gmail, and I'll be happy to send you a free copy. We've got a lot of free copies we want to give away, but we also have it in uh, Word form, and uh, if you want the document, we can email that to you, but we'd be very happy to have you have a free copy of the book. Okay, the information that I normally give you, it's all there. Please keep your Skype page open during the week for more encouragement. I'd like to stay in touch with you, so please keep the page open. Once again, at the end of October, October 29, which is a Thursday at 7 p.m., we're having our annual Elijah Challenge Gala. That's where we raise funds. So please join us on Zoom if you can't show up personally at the gala. Now, for some spiritual tea and refreshments, fellowship in our Lord Jesus, led by Brother Teddy. So, um, Brother Teddy, in a moment, let me turn off the recording, and you can begin.